her music right here on KROVFM, but not only are we spotlighting her, but we're going to be talking to her coming up. My co-host, Jackie. She's here. I'm here in the belly. <laughs> good morning. Okay, Jackie. It's all on you. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, San Antonio and global listeners. That's right, it's your girl Jackie, and I am glad to be back in the studio with you on this morning with my co-host, Pastor Lockhart. And we, and as he just said, you were listening to the wonderful melodic music of Sister Gail Fly. Good morning, Gail. Good morning. <laughs> it is such a pleasure and privilege to have you here on the radio with us this morning. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, let me just read a little bit of this bio here and then we'll get into some chit chat. But she okay. is a wife, she's a mother, she's an entrepreneur, a gospel recording artist. These are some of the names in which Gail Fly answers. Now she's also the first lady of Rising the, Raising the Standard Ministries where her husband, Pastor Albert Fly Sr. is the pastor. In addition to her music career, she is the executive director and co-founder of FLOSS, FNL Organizational Support Services Incorporated, supporting small businesses with human resources, finance, and board governance. Gail believes our purpose in life is to love God and love people. She recorded her first CD, Who Will Worship, in 2007, followed by her sophomore project, In His Presence, in 2011. Her first single, I Need You, was released in 2014. And that is the one that you guys just heard on the radio. And, you know, it was a beautiful, beautiful selection. Can you talk to us a little bit more about um, the whole idea of the CD, the project, and that song in particular? I'll, I'll start with I Need You. Thank you, Jackie. So, You're welcome. Um, I, I have lived my entire life on the premise and the belief that I can absolutely do nothing without God, right? Like, I, I tell people all the time, like, I'm not smart enough to come up with half of the things that God allows me to manifest in the earth realm. So I realize that anything that I'm allowed to do or, you know, produce or, or put out or, you know, accomplish, it is nothing of my own strength. I, I tell myself daily how much, mm. how much I need him. And, and that is something that, that I have been taught my whole life by my mom and, and it's something that I actually am, you know, putting in into our son. That's what's up. That That is what's up. Cause that is so true. We can't do anything uh -huh. without him. We can't uh -huh. do it. So what a fitting title. I need you. Now, uh -huh. did you always know you wanted to be an artist or how did, how did you come about into the artistry realm? So I grew up in the Church of God in Christ, and my mom was very active in ministry, so she was over the kids. So I, you know, I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice, like this mm -hmm. woman singing and and those kind of things in church. And then I remember very specifically, I was in uh, fifth grade, fifth grade when I sang my first like public solo, and I think that's when I actually knew that I could. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I mean, and I didn't know it, you know, not not at first, but like so many people were like, oh my God, like I didn't, I didn't know you could sing. And I think I was saying, oh my God, like I didn't either. <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, but it was actually my brother, my older brother, who's actually like a professional, like producer. He's worked with some of the major, you know, secular artists. It was actually him that pushed me and pushed me and it was pushing me probably from that day, right? But um, he and I connected like 2017 and we put the first part, I mean, 20, uh, I'm sorry, 2007 and we put the first, you know, project out. And I, I really, I credit him for the push. I really, really do to get me in the studio and get started. 
Wow. And you know what? You said a lot there. That support system and sometimes yeah. that push is so yeah. important because there are a lot of people who may be in your, in your you know, listening and they say, yeah. oh, I have a similar background as her, but I don't know where to get started. I don't know. Yeah. I've never seen myself in this realm. And we just right. need that one person to come along and believe and yeah. give that little push. And then it's like they say, the rest can be history sometimes. <laughs> now, now with going through that, because uh -huh. sometimes we, we see the end result. Okay, so we you sang at five, you knew um, that yes, I have this musical talent and ability, and you may may have kind of honed that throughout the years, but then you know your brother comes along and gives you this push. But can you talk to us about the process? Because a lot of times some people think, okay, I have this, I'm gonna go do this, and they, they see the end result and think, voila, it's gonna just work like a charm. So what, what was yeah. your process like in, in, cre in the creation of this project? And your sophomore one. So I'll I'll tell you. So the process that's that's interesting. Um, because I, I just you know heard a message about you know we like the prophecy, but we don't really want to you know deal with the process. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really been my whole life. So for example, that first project. I mean, it came out in in two thousand and seven, but mm -hmm. it started like a long time before that. And it was the process of, mm -hmm. of life that that hit me really hard. We started this I don't even know what what year we started recording, but it was it was a few years prior to the release. And what happened was, you know, if anybody was around in two thousand and five when this big old storm came through. <laughs> mm, okay. Yes ma'am. <laughs> It's devastating how alive that you know, you know, her I say Hurricane Katrina was um it was a milestone, it was a marker, a mm -hmm. mile marker in my life and it literally knocked the wind out of me. I was I was working on the project, you know, prior to that. And okay. so you, you can see kind of the span of time of the process, Jackie. And so mm -hmm. by the time all of that happened, I was pregnant, I had lost everything and I was determined that I was not going to sing. I, I didn't care about that anymore. And mm. even though it was my my brother that got me in the studio, it was my husband that got me back in. Mm -hmm. So we were relocated, you know, living with some of his family or with a friend. And I was just like, you know, the last thing that I was concerned about was finishing a, a project, right? Uh -huh. And my husband, you know, he just sat me down one day and, and he was like, Babe, you you have to finish this project. Like the Lord gave you this and there's so much, you know, message in it for the world and you know, and I know this is a lot, right? We've lost mm -hmm. our house, our car, like we're pregnant, like, you know, it's a lot. But he said, We're gonna get through this and you're gonna go back in the studio because the world is waiting for this project. And so you know, talking about that support system. So the process, Jackie, was all of the loss mm. in between starting and actually releasing. So you got the prophecy. Oh, are you going to, you know, are you going to sue? Are you going to have a CD? Like, blah, blah, blah. But the process was losing everything I had before wow. I got to the manifestation of the prophecy of the project. And it was my husband that was there, like, you know, literally nursing me back to my mental capacity <laughs> where mm. I could even think about going back in the studio and finishing. So that was that process. Wow. And, and you know, I, I so understand that. I so understand when you get the word, you have a vision, and even when you put out the first, because I put out a, a first project, and people are like, well, when are you going to put out the second one? And yeah. I'm like, well, you don't know what it cost me to put yeah. out the first yeah. one. Yeah. And the first one yeah. hasn't done what I thought it yeah. was going to do. And yeah. so now you're telling me to go back and do something uh -huh. else. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was, sometimes I say, God, I don't know if I had the energy to put uh -huh. all, you know, my heart and soul, yeah. blood, sweat, and tears uh -huh. into another one. But I guess uh -huh. when you are called and when you are, that is your purpose, you, you uh -huh. do it. You'll find somebody. Somebody will have to be the ones who hold up your arms when the battle is getting weary yeah. and say, no, you're going to do this. Yep, so, so I appreciate that part. But then, look, it didn't stop there for you because I didn't read all of your bio because the next part goes into saying that um, you are now an author. Um, let's see, her latest project adds author to her accomplishments. It is her first book, So You Want to Be a Worshipper, being released in the summer of 2019. So congrats on that. Now tell me about that. Yeah, that was another interesting process. You mm -hmm. know, I... I I did the writing 
around the book like a year ago mm-hmm. and then there were a lot of you know hiccups and delays that you know people didn't see and I didn't necessarily make public uh-huh. and um you know with my publisher like some things she was dealing with and I was actually you know supporting and like talking her through those things because I, I believe that she would you know come out of it and we get this done and so like fast forward we are at the point where the final final edits are done uh, and you know this was an interesting process because we had put out a release date for last year I mean like put it out there like you know book is coming out and then I mean started with the pre-orders and all and then we had a delay on the publisher side that kind of like knocked all that out right so mm-hmm. I'm looking like oh my god like people have started you know ordering the book uh-huh. I'm not gonna have it and, and then I just said you know Gail this is just another process and I tell people all the time I've learned a lot through this writing this book you know becoming an author the, the book is coming out this summer mm-hmm. and um I just feel like, like you say, you know, if people want to jump up and do things without uh-huh. really thinking about like all that could happen and all the delays and the scheduling. It's a, it's a, a this was um, a good learning, I think, you know, moment for me. And I, and I always say that I don't have a lot of patience, and I feel like this was in, in some way this was God saying, you want you want patience. to KROV in your car, working, working out. out, or on vacation. Visit KROVFM.com for more details. Okay, well, that was just a commercial break. <laughs> so now, I have the privilege of speaking with Pastor Albert E. Fly Sr. Now, let me go ahead and read some of your bio so the people kind of have an idea of who we're talking to. Uh, he is a native New Orleans the fifth of five children and the only boy of four siblings. He was educated in the New Orleans public school system and attended Sydney Collier Voltech School, where he earned a certificate in carpentry. He is the husband of Gail Vickers Fly and the proud father of Albert E. Fly Jr. Uh, Albert E. Fly Jr., excuse me. 
Albert began his career in the hospitality industry over 20 years ago, where he worked through various positions in the food and beverage department. Knowing from a very young age that the hand of God and the call of ministry was upon his life, Albert surrendered his life to Christ and soon worked through the ranks of ministry as an ordained minister, was later elevated to elder and later to associate pastor. And without further ado, this morning I want to welcome you, Elder Fly, to the radio the radio <laughs> station. How are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm fine. Doing fine. How are you this morning? I, you know, I am doing wonderful. I am doing wonderful. So give us a little insight on your ministry, because as I was reading your bio, you know how technology it works with you sometimes and it doesn't at other times. So the bio just went off the screen. So I'm like, okay, well great. Maybe it's, it's time for you to just jump in there and tell us about yourself. <laughs> so talk to well, me about your ministry. Um, well, back in 2013, the Lord, the Lord um, called us to start a, start a church um, by the name of Reagan Standard Ministries, which uh, the Lord birthed in my spirit back in 1980s. And, uh, you know, there is a process before you become pastor, but the Lord shows you what he's going to do with you. Shows you the end before at the end, mm. and so knowing from the age of twelve that I was called that I was called to preach, I I kind of like you know ran from that thing because I didn't really understand what I was seeing and understand what God was getting ready to do. So I ran, but I was always in church, always knowing that the hand of God was on me, always had a heart of disturbance. Mm -hmm. And so we just we just uh, helped out my 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 apostle and some other other pastors that I work with until the Lord uh, saw fit to do what he needed to do with us. And back in 2013, as I said, the Lord told me to start a Bible study on a Tuesday night. He said, started Bible study. And from there, the Bible study grew into a Sunday service. And the Lord's been, been gracious to us. And so we've been just doing what the Lord called us to do. Fantastic. Now, now you talk about you knew at an early age that you were called into the ministry, but then you ran. Can you tell why did you run? Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, you see things that you really don't want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. I, I think being in ministry, seeing certain things happen in ministry, and not really wanting to play with God, and not really wanting to, you know, be be. Uh, responsible for people, mm. and so I said, "Nah, this ain't for me. This ain't for me." <laughs> and then, you know, as a young as a young kid, you know, my grand growing up with my grandmother, I was in church every day, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I was like, you know, I'm all churched out. It's time for me to live my life, and so mm -hmm. I found out going into living your life ain't really living your life. Right, right. There, there was there was some consequences, mm -hmm. and so you know, uh, after being after hitting my head a couple of times, you know, there, there came a point I just said, "Okay, God, I can't run no more. What you want?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, that ultimate surrender will do it for you. And I asked you that question because on the other side of it. You know, I have this conversation so often with people and, and try to explain to them and express to them how important the role of a pastor is in my world. And I said, I, and it saddens me sometimes to think that people have kind of watered that down because of experiences or because of the commercialism of it all. But um, I, I really think that the shepherd, the shepherd is so important in the lives of the flock. And then, like you said, a servant's heart. I think I think that right there is is the key. A servant's heart and wanting to see people draw closer to God and wanting them to, you know, prosper in their spiritual life just as well as they do in the other realms of life that make them a, a whole person and so i i thank you for saying some of those things because shepherds can pick i mean sheep can pick up <laughs> when the shepherd says certain things it's like oh, okay yeah maybe i should be listening <laughs> listening because this person is really leading me toward the cross and toward christ so i appreciate that part of it what is, what do you say is the biggest um the biggest pillar of your ministry um wanting to see the lives of people change mm-hmm um, Jesus, Jesus had a compassion for the people. Whenever he got to a place or town, he had compassion. 
impact and he was concerned about the people. And I believe that in this 21st century church, pastor, pastorship has become commercialized where people are not concerned with being a servant. Jesus was the Christ, but he was a servant. Mm -hmm. He did more servant than being served. And I believe that when the pastor has the heart of the people and he serves the community and he serves the people, the people in return will serve him. Mm -hmm. uh, a good, good example of that is Paul. Paul said, if I saw it for you, spiritual things, is it not good for me to reap up your corn? Now, Paul wasn't just just trying to get a new car or a new house uh, live in a gated community. He was he was concerned about changing the lives of people because we, 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 we're getting caught up in membership. And Jesus said, membership is not what we're after. I'm concerned with discipleship. Mm. There is a word that, that's not happening in the church called change. Mm. Because we have gotten, we have gotten um, completion with mm -hmm. just another 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 service. Three songs, six parts, and then we go home. Right. But when you ask well, what what did the pastor preach? They said, Well, I don't know. I know he did I know he preached, but I don't know what he preached about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, people I think sometimes we go more for the experience. You know, uh, of and and for the lack of saying, or you know, for lack of better term, saying, "Hey, I went to church. I did it." Except, you know, and somebody was saying, "How you go and how you expect God will meet you at the level of your expectancy." And so, yeah. I appreciate that those things are forefront of your ministry. Now, on that note, I see that you guys have had how long has your ministry been around? This will be our fifth year. Our fifth year anniversary that we're celebrating. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. So your anniversary is coming up. When When is the date? Uh, May, 8, May, 8, May 19th. May 19th at 3 o'clock. Uh, okay. And so where? what is the address of your church? So those who are listening in the New Orleans area, um, or if you're heading to New Orleans and, and uh, need an event, a church event, and a worship experience to go to, they can come join your service. Um, right now, we're in a temporary location mm -hmm. at... Uh, 
continue to give God praise in what they're going through. He moves you to a place called worship. He brings you to the presence of God. And the Bible says that in the presence of God, everything that you need is in God's presence. He will give you strategies. He will give you ideas. He will give you uh, ways to defeat the enemy. Mm. Because uh, he, he, gives, he, gives us, he gives us the know that we've already got the victory. You don't have to fight for victory, but fight from your place of victory. Mm. And there you have it, listeners. There you have it. God has already given us the victory. You just stand through those swift transitions that come with life because that's part of it. But God has already given us the victory. So Pastor Fly and Sister Fly, First Lady Fly, we thank you guys for being with us this morning. Um, we, we pray nothing but prosperity and peace over your ministry and that it will flourish and that we'll have this interview down the road when the book comes out so you want to be a worshiper and when you guys are celebrating moving into your permanent residence. So we, we are just believe, standing and believing God with you for all things. Things and, and we love you and if there's anything we can ever do to help just reach out thank you all so much thank you love thank, you guys love you too and listeners, we uh, thank you for hanging in there with us again yet another week. Uh, we love you, and we will see you same time, same, ta same station next week.